Good morning and welcome to our first lecture in sensor systems. The first lecture will be called Exploratory. You will see why in a minute. My name is Martin Novak. I'm coming from the Department of Instrumentation and Control Engineering at uh, the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and I will have the lectures and uh, also the lab classes uh, for this subject. So if you need anything related to this topic then uh, contact me in my office or write me an email on the address that you will see here. Uh, what will be done in this subject? Uh, we will be talking about sensors and uh, then we'll be talking about uh, methods that are used to get the signal from the sensor and uh, to process the signal if you need for example to filter the signal if you need uh, to plot uh, an instrumentation diagram or if you need to validate the signal from your sensor so in the first uh, five lectures we'll be talking about the sensors itself we will be talking about uh, pressure sensors and humidity about flow sensors and about liquid level sensors uh, on today's lecture we'll explore what uh, the students remember from uh, previous classes you have had uh, a previous class on basics of sensors where we have discussed uh, temperature sensors uh, force sensors uh, we've discussed uh, position sensors and so on <clears throat> so in this class I will assume that uh, you have the knowledge from this initial class if not uh, then you will have to take a look on uh, the videos from the lectures and uh, get the knowledge yourselves now the reason why the first uh, lecture today is called exploratory is that I'd like to explore what is the knowledge of the student about the basic sensors especially about temperature sensors and about force sensors because the temperature and force sensors are very important for a mechanical engineer quite often you are designing machine where you need to install some temperature sensors uh, you are designing some machine where you need to measure the strain on selected points of your machine so for this reason uh, we will very briefly cover those sensors on this first lecture so on today's lecture I will be talking about selected temperature sensors and uh, selected force sensors it will not be a very deep and detailed description of those sensors if you need it then you should uh, take a look on the other videos where uh, I am explaining in more detail what those sensors are doing and how can you use them. In the following lectures we'll be covering selected types of industrial sensors. So we'll definitely not cover all of them, that's uh, impossible, but uh, we'll focus only on some of them and I will explain how the sensor works I will show some industrial examples of this sensor and uh, then we'll be talking also about how to install the sensor properly in an application. So this will happen in the first uh, five weeks of our class. Then in week number six we'll be talking about uh, industrial output signals but uh, we will be focusing only on analog signals so only on voltage or current outputs the reason why I will focus on analog signals in this class is that uh, the students uh, that have our study, study branch, study master uh, you will have um, a specialized class devoted only for digital buses so uh, we'll be talking about analog signals here and uh, digital signals will be covered in a specialized class. Then in week number seven we'll be talking about uh, process and instrumentation diagrams. 
So this is a way how you can plot the description or how you can plot the schematic of uh, your industrial process and include the instrumentation in there. So you will already know the basic principles of your sensors from our first few weeks. And then after lecture number seven, you'll be able to plot this in a diagram so that uh, other people can understand easily with standard symbols how your process is working and where is your instrumentation. And then uh, at the end of our semester, so from week number eight until the end, uh, we'll focus on signals and uh, signal processing methods. So we will have a quite large topic that's called sensor fusion. This will be about how to process your signal from the sensor, how to fuse it uh, with uh, the signals from other sensors. For example, you fuse uh, several temperature sensors together, or you may fuse um, the data from accelerometer and gyroscope and get, uh, let's call it the better information that uh, you would get otherwise just uh, from an individual sensor. So this is quite a large topic. We'll be spending uh, at least four lectures on that. And in the last two weeks, we'll be talking uh, about other methods that are used to validate the signals from our sensor. So those methods will allow us to make an estimate, for example, if our signal is valid, if uh, we may expect some problem with the sensor, for example, if we compare two sensors or three sensors or more, how we can find out if uh, one sensor is faulty and uh, how to implement this as an algorithm. Uh, for all lectures, I will be making uh, videos. So um, I will post the videos uh, later on the internet. So uh, if you look uh, later on our subject uh, web page, in Moodle, uh, you'll be able to get the videos and uh, if you are a registered student of this class, you'll be also able to get the additional materials. Now the additional materials uh, may be, for example, uh, a library or um, a description how to make the process and instrumentation diagrams. Uh, it will be a software um, that will show the algorithms in MATLAB and uh, other stuff uh, will be available as well. Now as far as for the lab classes, the topics are shown here on the right. So um, if uh, the situation will allow it and the school labs will be open, we'll be having uh, real lab classes. If uh, not, if uh, the school will still be closed, then uh, we'll have uh, to find some other way how to uh, perform the classes. Anyway, the plan is that uh, in the first uh, few weeks we'll be talking about the sensors. So uh, we'll be doing some experiments or simulations or maybe some, some project-based approach. And then in the end of the semester, like let's say from week number three to week number six, not a week, but uh, the, the number of a class, uh, we'll be discussing the algorithms. Our classes, uh, there are only six of them, since uh, this class uh, has uh, the lab only every second week. So uh, we'll meet uh, with the students every second week as by the prescribed schedule. Let's take a look on what study literature can you use. Now, uh, there is no single book that covers all the topics. So uh, this class will be a selection of uh, several sources. It's not only books, but it's also um, application notes, uh, data sheets, web pages and stuff like this. But here I've tried to list uh, the basic uh, books that uh, you may study. Now for the part of the sensors, uh, you may use uh, a book that's called Introduction to Sensors for Electrical and Mechanical Engineers, authored by me. 
and it was published in CRC Press in 2020. Uh, the three other sources uh, are also about the sensors. So uh, if something is not covered in this first book, then you may find the info in those other other literature. And uh, the last uh, link is uh, a book uh, about sensor fusion. Uh, again, I will cover only a part of the of the topics that are used in this book. Uh, I have selected only a few topics that um, I will apply uh, in simulation models so that you can see how those method works. Um, you, you don't need to get those books. You can of course uh, follow the lectures and follow the labs and uh, this will give you enough info so that you can pass the exam in the end. So let's start. Today, as I was already saying, uh, we'll be repeating stuff from the basic class so that uh, we start all at approximately the same level of uh, knowledge. So the first sensor that I like to talk about is uh, called an RTD. An RTD stands for a resistance temperature detector. So it's a sensor that changes electrical resistance with temperature. Now there are several types of uh, RTDs that uh, are used in industrial applications. I will be covering only the platinum sensor. The reason is simple. A platinum sensor is the most common it's the most accurate one so it's used uh, ex almost exclusively in uh, industrial applications so an application where you need the sensor to be reliable to be stable in long term and uh, also to be very accurate so how it, can we describe the behavior of our sensor now, from physics, you probably know this equation. Now, this equation relates a temperature a resistance at a given temperature, RT, if we know the initial resistance, this formula is R0, so resistance for 0 centigrade. We know the temperature coefficient of resistance, alpha, and we know what is our temperature. So what we want to do if we are using an RTD is that the input of my sensor is some temperature T and uh, I measure the resistance of my sensor. Now this formula is valid with a good level of accuracy only if uh, we are in a relatively small range. And uh, by small range I will understand here approximately plus minus 100 centigrade. In this range we can define the temperature coefficient of resistance alpha and you can see it's a ratio that uh, is telling me what is the change of resistance between 100 centigrade and uh, 0 centigrade. Now if I want to write an equation that uh, has a higher accuracy or uh, works in a larger range I need to use an equation that will be more complex so it will look like this uh, we have uh, more coefficients in uh, our equation you can see that I have coefficients a B and C now and uh, we'll see the values for this on the next slide uh, in this equation we can see that uh, it's no more a linear equation we have t squared and here we have t cubed but uh, if you want to describe uh, the dependence of electrical resistance on temperature in a larger range and you need this type of equation now this equation this formula is uh, valid only for the platinum sensor if uh, you would use for example nickel then uh, it would be even more complicated you would need more coefficients than the three seen in this equation. So 
uh, why do we use platinum? Uh, platinum is a very stable metal so this means that uh, the sensor will not change its properties in time so it will have a good long-term stability Platinum has also a relatively high re electrical resistance. So this means that uh, I can build a sensor that will have uh, relatively small dimensions and uh, high electrical resistance. And for this reason, I can measure a larger electrical voltage on the sensor. So I can use a small current that's flowing through the sensor and this will have an effect on self-heating. Probably the biggest advantage of platinum sensor is uh, the accuracy. Platinum sensors are very accurate. We'll see in a minute what is the approximate accuracy of that. And this means that uh, I can interchange the sensors in my applications without recalibrating it. So I will buy a sensor from one manufacturer, I know that it's class A, which we'll see in a, min in a minute what that means. And uh, if I need to replace the sensor for any reason, I take the sensor with the same accuracy class, I will put that in my application and uh, I don't need to calibrate it. We'll see later that this is not the case of all temperature sensors. For example, if we were using thermistors, then uh, we need to do recalibration because they will not be as accurate as uh, platinum RTDs. Uh, how do we describe the platinum sensors? It's described with some letters. So PT, which stands for platinum, and then some number and this number is telling me what is the electrical resistance of my sensor if I have temperature of precisely zero centigrade so for example if I have a PT100 which is the most common type it has precisely 100 ohms for zero centigrade you can also find, uh, for example, a PT-1000 and this means that it has precisely 1000 ohms for 0 centigrade. Both types are used, uh, sometimes you may need PT-100, sometimes you may need uh, PT-1000. That really depends on what application uh, are you designing and uh, in, in what ranges uh, of temperatures and it, what, with what currents do you need to measure your temperature. So how can we describe the PT100 in terms of an equation? Here we are again with our formula that relates the resistance at a given temperature T to the coefficients A, B, C and the temperature that I have. Now this formula is uh, having three coefficients and you can see the values of those coefficients on this slide. Now, if uh, I am in a smaller range, let's say plus minus 100 centigrade, I start at zero, for example, and I'm moving plus 100 and minus 100 like this, we can see that uh, this is a fairly linear dependence. So if I'm not looking for a really high extreme, I would say accuracy, in this small temperature range, I can use only the first coefficient in my equation. The other coefficients, B and C, we can see that uh, here there are about five orders of magnitude smaller than A. So if I have a small value of T here and small value of T there, then uh, this value in this, uh, this number and this number in the equation will be almost zero. So in a small range I can use only the value of A. Uh, note that uh, the, the A value is positive so uh, it means that the electrical 
resistance uh, will increase with uh, the increasing temperature. So this is a typical property of uh, metallic RTDs, or metals in general, that they are increasing the electrical resistance with temperature. You see later with thermistors it might not be like that. And if I'm using only this linear description with uh, just the A coefficient, I can define the sensitivity of my chart here, of my equation. And sensitivity is nothing else than the slope of my line here. And uh, we can see that the slope, the sensitivity of a PT100 is uh, 0 0.39 ohms per centigrade. So if my initial resistance for PT100 here, 0 centigrades, is 100 ohms, I will increase the temperature by 1 centigrade, I will get uh, 100 Point thirty nine ohms. So we will see later that uh, it's necessary to measure fairly small changes of uh, electrical resistance if I want to have an accurate reading of uh, a platinum RTD. And the numbers that you can see here are based on the international standard IEC 751. Uh, there are however other standards as well that's based on the purity of the platinum, on the way it's processed. So uh, there are other sensitivities that you may find on the market. So there are differences between uh, IEC and uh, the ANSI standard, for example. Uh, although they are very slight, for example, it's not 0 0.39, might be something like 0 0.38. Uh, however, it's important to remember that uh, it's not always this and uh, that you need to be careful and select uh, the standard that suits your needs and uh, your applications. We can see in the chart that uh, it's not linear. Uh, however, if we are really in a small range, the PT sensor is uh, fairly linear. If we work in a larger range or if we are looking for larger accuracies, then it is not linear. Uh, let's take a look on how accurate can uh, the platinum sensor be. Uh, the platinum sensors they are it's it's using uh, very pure platinum, so typically ninety nine point nine 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 percent. There are at least two standard accuracy classes. The classes are called Class A and Class B. And class A is the more accurate one. And to give you an idea what is approximately the accuracy, let's take a look on this table. Now in this table we can see the temperature and we can see several classes B and A and we can see the accuracy in centigrades and then in ohms. So for example, if I have temperature 0 centigrade here, we know that this will have a resistance of 100 ohms. Then in class B, I'm able to measure 0 centigrade plus minus 0.3. And in ohms, you see that this is 120 milliohms. Now if I need a more accurate sensor, I can choose class A. And here we can see it's a uh, 0.15 centigrades, and that's 60 milliohms. You can also find uh, some other description how the accuracy is given. For example, here you can see that they call it one third class B, and uh, this gives us uh, about uh, 0.1 centigrade accuracy. Now typically accuracy is uh, not given in absolute values like we see that in this table but it's given in as a percentage of something. So for example here you can see okay 100 centigrades plus minus uh, 0.8 centigrades accuracy for class B so this would correspond to 0.8 percent 
and here for example this would uh, correspond to 0.35 percent so uh, class A has uh, about half of uh, the width of my interval so it has about double the accuracy compared to class B you can see that now here uh, it's able to measure typically up to 600 centigrades from minus 200 this is uh, approximately the range uh, where a platinum sensor might be used even here we have 600 centigrades and we have um, 3.3 centigrades accuracy for class B and uh, 1.35 centigrades accuracy for class A so uh, this is um, about 0.5 percent and this is uh, maybe about 0.2-0.3 percent so uh, for a platinum RTD what you can expect is that the accuracy would be something like 0.2-0.3 percent you can have a more accurate one which will be more expensive uh, if you don't need that kind of accuracy you can get uh, class B type and uh, it will be much less expensive now how does it look like uh, typically there are several ver versions of uh, the platinum sensor but typically it's uh, like a glass encased version so it's like a glass cylinder and uh, here we have the thin platinum wire the diameter is um, approximately 0.05 millimeters so approximately 50 micrometers and uh, it's wound in this uh, glass encasing the way it's wound it's called a bifiller winding now this is a special way of winding that uh, minimizes inductance and uh, you can see that Oh, the, the wires run along here like in pairs and uh, it's finished like this in a loop so it's like a one loop that, that runs along this it's not like a coil that end, that begins on one end and ends in the other direct end of my, of my winding and then of course we have uh, some terminals that we use this uh, to connect uh, to our circuit or to our appliance now typically the glass uh, RTD, the PT sensor, can be used uh, up to 100, uh, sorry, 600 centigrades, and uh, the price of this sensor itself is typically in the range uh, between 50 and uh, 100 euros per piece. So the sensor is fairly expensive compared, for example, to thermistors but uh, on the other hand uh, it has a very high accuracy long-term stability and uh, repeatability uh, this is how the sensor looks like so it is a glass cylinder here you can see the thin platinum wire that's embedded inside and uh, here we can see the terminals uh, that we use to connect to our appliance now the dimensions uh, they vary based on what what you need in what you need in terms of range, uh, in terms of uh, uh, space that you have available, and uh, also in terms of uh, say the technology how this was manufactured. But uh, the ones that you can see on the picture, the length is about four centimeters, and uh, the diameter is uh, something like four or five millimeters. So compared, for example, with thermistors, it is uh, a much larger sensor. It will have um, a larger time constant, but on the other hand, it is a very accurate one. Now, the second type of sensor that I will cover is uh, called a thermistor. Now, a thermistor is uh, a sensor that is also based on a change of electrical resistance with temperature however a thermistor is not based on a metal it is based on a semiconductor material so we'll see that it will have completely different properties compared to a, an RTD RTDs the, the, the name uh, is uh, used for metallic 
temperature sensors and the name thermistor is used for the semiconductor components. Now you know that uh, we may have two types of uh, semiconductors p-type and n-type based on uh, what materials are used and there will be also two types of uh, thermistors. However, the types of thermistors will be distinguishing what is the temperature coefficient. So for a platinum RTD we know that uh, we have a positive temperature coefficient so that the electrical resistance was increasing with temperature but for thermistors we will have positive temperature coefficient which will be called PTC but also negative temperature coefficient and this will be called NTC. Now there is also a major difference in the shape of uh, the curve that describes resistance as a function of temperature. Now for PT sensor we see that this is a fairly linear response. Our resistance is increasing if I'm increasing temperature. On the other hand thermistors will have a very non-linear response. Let's take a look first on the PTC. Now the name implies that it has a positive temperature coefficient. So the resistance would increase if I'm increasing the temperature. However, it's more complicated. We can see a typical dependence in this picture. Now typically, the electrical resistance will first decrease slightly like that and starting from some specific temperature the electric resistance will increase so in this region of my curve I have a negative temperature coefficient and in this part of the curve I have a positive temperature coefficient so by looking on this graph we can see that this will probably not be a very good temperature sensor because for example if I read an electrical resistance here now what temperature do I have? Do I have this temperature or do I have this temperature? So for this reason the PTCs are typically not used as temperature sensors although you may find some of them but PTCs are typically used as temperature fuses. And they operate somewhere in this region so if it's normally powered then you are here you have, you have a fairly low resistance and uh, if you are above some given temperature this uh, resistance will increase very sharply and uh, it will disconnect the current from your circuit. So uh, PTC is typically used as a temperature fuse. If we look on NTC, we can see that here it will have better properties in terms of sensors because here we don't have any point where we would read the resistance and this would give us two tem possible temperature readings like we had here on, uh, on our PTC. So NTCs are typically used as temperature sensors. Uh, note that uh, this is uh, a very large change of electrical resistance. Now this change might be few orders of magnitude. So it does not have to be linear, but uh, this is quite a large change of electrical resistance. Now if we want to describe this curve, again uh, we've done that in, uh, in the basic class. Uh, it is essentially an exponential curve. So uh, the electrical resistance is a function of my input temperature. Uh, then th those coefficients are not really important right now in, in the, the explanation. Uh, just uh, remember that uh, it's based on the material and uh, you can typically find uh, this info in the data sheet of uh, your temperature sensor. So it's an exponential 
response. We can see an example here. Uh, here on X uh, axis, uh, this would be temperature. And uh, here on the Y axis, this would be electrical resistance. And uh, this is uh, a curve that is uh, from some data sheet. So typically in a, a data sheet, uh, you will either find uh, an equation like this with the coefficients. You will, can find it also as a chart like that or you can find it as a table giving you the resistance as a function of temperature. Now how does the thermistor look like? It's a fairly small sensor so it can be used uh, in applications where you have constraints in space and uh, it is also a quite fast sensor so it will have a small time constant compared to a platinum sensor. It's typically like a small ball of uh, the semiconductor material that we see here. The diameter of this ball lies somewhere in the range uh, between 0 0.2 and uh, 3 millimeters. So it's quite small. And then you have the two terminals uh, for connection of your circuit. Now typically the sensor is not used like that. You don't put that directly in your application. You can do it in the lab uh, if you have um, no chemical damage or mechanical damage that may occur to the sensor. But uh, in industrial applications uh, we need to protect the sensor from uh, mechanical and chemical damage. So we put that in a thermal well. A thermal well is a tube that is sealed at one end over here and the sensor is inside of the tube and uh, this tube is then mounted in your application. It might be a tank, it might be a pipe, whatever you need it. So the thermal well protects the sensor from mechanical and chemical damage that may occur in your application. Here are the connecting wires so uh, you can either have uh, like a ceramic insulation or it might be like a plastic insulation that uh, really depends on the temperature where you will use uh, the temperature sensor. Now the thermistor is a fairly low price. This might be something like 50 cents maybe even smaller and uh, if we compare that uh, with uh, the platinum sensor it is like um, 100 times cheaper but on the other hand it is also less accurate so for a thermistor you may expect the accuracy of uh, let's say plus minus 2 centigrades with plus minus 5 maybe plus minus 10 again depends on uh, the type that uh, that you choose uh, and uh, what are the, their specifications. So if you are looking for a really low cost sensor, you don't care about the low accuracy and about uh, bad uh, behavior in long term, bad uh, interchangeability, then uh, a thermistor is a good sensor to use. If you're using, uh, if you're requiring uh, a high accuracy sensor, good long term behavior, then go for a platinum RTD. Now let's take a look on uh, how we will connect the sensors in a circuit. So we will need a circuit that uh, on the input of this circuit we will have uh, something that's changing electrical resistance based on the temperature, so um, either an RTD or a thermistor and uh, the output will be a voltage signal. And we need to keep in mind that uh, the changes of electrical resistance, especially in case of uh, platinum RTDs, might be fairly small. For a platinum, we know that uh, the sensitivity of a PT100 is uh, 0.39 ohms per centigrade. So if I want to read my output with, uh, say, 0.1 centigrade accuracy, I need to be able to read approximately a change of uh, 40 milliohms. 
For this reason, we will use a special circuit, uh, which will be a Wheatstone bridge. I will show you three types of bridges that uh, we may use, three connections. And uh, then the fourth connection uh, will not be a bridge, but uh, will be still suitable for RTDs and thermistors. Now, all the circuits that you will see are suitable for RTDs and thermistors as well. But some of them will be more suitable for RTDs and uh, the, the last one will be more suitable for a thermistor. So let's take a look on the first connection. Now this connection is called a two-wire connection. The reason is simple. We count the wires that are going to our temperature sensor. So here we have the sensor itself. I've called it R4. And this is the sensor that measures temperature in my application. Temperature is T. And it is connected to two wires to my bridge circuit. Now this bridge circuit typically might be quite a distance away from my sensor. So my sensor is somewhere in my pipe or somewhere in the tank and this may sit a uh, few meters away in some appliance. Now this is a bridge connection. So uh, we have resistors R1, R2, R3 and the fourth one is the resistor R4 in my bridge. And together this forms a Wheatstone bridge. Now we have a power supply here. It's a DC power supply. So uh, we need to provide some power either from an AC, from adapter that, that will provide us DC, fairly stable DC voltage, or it might be, for example, some batteries. You can see that uh, here I have added one additional resistor that I have labeled RJ and uh, this resistor serves uh, to balance the wiring resistance between the bridge and uh, the sensor to some known value, for example 16 ohms. But it will not play a big role in uh, the properties of the circuit. We know that uh, if I'm changing temperature T, I can change and I can calculate the resistance of my sensor based on this formula. This is a simple one, but uh, we could of course use also the more complex one like the three coefficients. Now what is the problem with this circuit? If uh, we analyze the circuit, we may come to an equation that's called an equation of balance that will describe the bridge. And uh, the equation of balance is like this. It's R1 times R4 equals to R2 to R3. And when this condition of balance is maintained, we will have a zero output voltage of our bridge. So V out here, that's uh, where our voltmeter will be. So if we are operating this connection in a balanced mode, which means that we are looking for zero output voltage, we are changing the values of uh, those resistors in the bridge, R1 through R3, in such a way that uh, we have zero output voltage. And then, based on the settings that we have on the scales on our resistors, uh, then we may uh, read the temperature here on the on the sensor. So, condition of balance: R1 times R4 equals R2 to R3. However, R4 in the formula is not just the R4 that we have here in my circuit but it's the total resistance that we have in this branch of uh, the bridge. So it's R4 plus RJ plus the wire resistance, which is shown here with this uh, red ellipse. So the balance or unbalance of the bridge is influenced also by the wire resistance that I have here 
that are connecting the the sensor to the sen to the bridge. And therefore, if uh, the resistance of this wire is changing, it will manifest itself as the changes of uh, the temperature reading that I get from resistor R4. So this two-wire connection is uh, sensitive to changes of ambient temperature. Ambient temperature changes that it will cause the change of resistance of my connecting wires and this will be visible on the output voltage. Now to give you an idea how big this effect will be, uh, let's take a look on this uh, calculation example. Now in this calculation I have used a twisted pair Ethernet cable and uh, the only reason why I have used this in the calculation is that uh, you know how this cable looks like. So you have an idea about what are the diameters of the cables, uh, what are basically the properties of it. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that this is an ideal cable for a sensor. There are other cables that are more suitable for that. So really the only reason is that you have an idea how this cable looks like. Now this Ethernet cable has uh, the electrical resistance of approximately 190 millivol milliohms per meter. It's made from copper. Uh, in tables we can find that uh, this is the temperature coefficient of uh, electrical resistance of copper. And uh, let's assume we have uh, 10 meters of wire. Don't forget that uh, the wire is going to the sensor and back. So this uh, represents uh, the 5 meter distance between the sensor and the bridge. And 5 meters, that's nothing in an industrial application. It might be very easily 50 meters, 100 meters of cable that you require. So this is really just an example that will give you the idea about the importance of uh, temperature compensation. And let's say that uh, my temperature around my cabling here will change by 10 centigrades. Now if we calculate the change in electrical resistance we will find out that this will give me 76 milliohms. So 10 centigrades will change this electrical resistance. Now if you remember what is the um, sensitivity of a platinum sensor, I've uh, said it's uh, 0.39 ohms per centigrade. So uh, I have 39 milli ohms uh, and uh, here this uh, has changed me 76 milli ohms. So it's not as big as uh, 1 centigrade in uh, the change of temperature and the sensor but it's not negligible. So uh, this connection is good only if you have a constant temperature around your connecting wires. So for example in a lab it's fine to use this two-wire connection but as soon as you require a temperature compensation or if you are not sure about uh, those conditions around the connecting wires you cannot use this two-wire connection. So although the two-wire connection is a very simple one, it's uh, the, the worst connection that you can actually use. There is an online simulation. If you have this presentation in, uh, in PowerPoint, which is available to our students, then uh, you can get this link and uh, you can simulate yourself the circuit in this simulation I'm changing the wire resistance here and uh, you will see the effect on the output voltage here of my, my bridge connection. So how can we improve this? How can we compensate automatically for the temperature changes around my wiring? I will show you two ways how this could be done. The first we will call that a three-wire connection. 
three wires are going to my sensor so again R4 is my temperature sensor and we have three wires connecting the sensor to the bridge the bridge is still the same now note that uh, the wire from R3 is going to the sensor and uh, the wire from this branch of the bridge is going to the sensor and then again there is an RJ resistor and uh, it's connecting the sensor to the bridge so what will happen if I'm changing the ambient temperature around the wiring here the, the points, uh, the areas marked in, in red here we remember the condition of balance it was R1 times R4 equals to R2 times R3 but R3 is not this R3 only but it's R3 plus everything that is in this branch so plus this wire resistance as well and the same is for R4 so R4 plus Rj plus this resistance plus this resistance we can see that uh, on the equation of balance we have R1 times R4 and then R2 times R3 so on one side of the equation we have R4 and on the other side we have R3 so in this connection if uh, my resistance around R3 that's around this connecting wire will increase and uh, if uh, I will have the same increase around R4 so R4 is on one side of the equation, R3 is on the other side so it will basically cancel out in the equation of balance so if I assume that uh, this resistance is changing in the same way like this resistance this circuit will automatically compensate for the changes of uh, resistance of the wires with temperature and I can easily do that because those cables those wires may run in a single cable and then the assumption that uh, they will have the same temperature is uh, fairly reasonable so you connect a circuit like this you run the wire to the circuit to the sensor and, and back like that and uh, it will automatically compensate for temperature changes now again there is an online simulation uh, where I'm changing the resistance of my wiring and uh, you will see that there is no effect on the output voltage the second way how we can do the compensation is called a lead resistance loop it's using exactly the same principle only now we connect uh, four wires to our sensor so maybe this uh, schematic is uh, a little more comprehensible uh, if you want to understand the circuit and now we have four wires from the bridge to the sensor however two wires are connected to the sensor like that and two wires are going to the sensor and back without being connected and all those wires run in a single cable so you have a cable with four wires you connect two of them to your sensor and the terminal box and uh, the same terminal box then you connect just two wires like that together the effect is the same if uh, I assume that the wires have the same temperature then uh, it means that uh, if, if this increases resistance this will increase the resistance in the same way but uh, R1 times R4 equals to R2 times R3 so R3 and R4 are on the opposite sides of my equation and uh, it will cancel the effect of the, the temperature changes again there is an online simulation which you can use you will see that there is no effect of uh, the wire resistance change on the output voltage all those three circuits that you've seen so far are suitable for platinum RTDs because they are quite sensitive and they are able to measure
quite small changes in electrical resistance. You may use them also for a thermistor, but uh, for the thermistor this is uh, a more suitable connection. But again you can use this connection also for a platinum RTD. So what is it doing? We will call this a four wire connection. Four wire because uh, there will be four wires going to the sensor. But in fact this is a, a more complicated uh, connection. We require a constant current source. A constant current source is uh, a source that is able to provide constant current regardless of uh, the resistance or impedance in general that we have uh, connected in the circuit. So in our circuit we'll be talking about resistance and this will be the resistance of uh, my sensor. So here this source is pushing a constant current through my circuit like that. The value of this current depends on uh, the type of the sensor. If uh, you have uh, a platinum RTD, like PT100, the current is uh, typically 1 milliamp. If uh, it's uh, a thermistor, then it's typically something like 50 microamps. And uh, we measure the voltage on uh, our sensor. So this is changing resistance as a function of temperature. Our current is constant, it's maintained with the feedback with the current loop in the, in the cu current source. And from Ohm's law we know that voltage is uh, resistance times current. So if resistance is changing with temperature and current is constant, I can read the voltage and uh, the voltage will be a function of temperature. Now in order to do this you need a voltmeter that has a fairly high internal resistance. We need this because uh, we want that the current flowing in those two wires to the voltmeter is almost zero. If my current is zero it means that uh, I will have no voltage drop on my wires and hence I don't care about the changes of resistance in uh, those connecting wires because uh, the current is zero and there is no voltage drop. By very high internal resistance I mean here at least a few mega ohms. So if you use a digital voltmeter it's not a problem at all. Uh, digital voltmeters they typically have uh, input resistance of uh, at least 10 mega ohms. So this current will be very small. Mm, so this is a simple connection in terms of measurements. Uh, however you need a constant current source that is able to provide uh, a fairly accurate value of the current. There is an online simulation so again uh, if uh, you are our student you can run the simulation and you will see that uh, the wire resistance between the voltmeter and the sensor here and here will not play any role on the reading that you get uh, on this uh, voltmeter. Okay, so uh, that's all for temperature sensors. And now in the remaining time, we have about 15 minutes left, I'll be talking about strain gauges, another very important uh, type of sensor for a mechanical engineer. I'll be talking only about uh, metal strain gauges, so we'll not cover any other methods such as optical fibers or any other way how you can actually measure the strain. I'll be talking only about the strain gauge. There are basically two types of strain gauges, semiconductor strain gauges and metal strain gauges. They all have some advantages and disadvantages. I'll be talking only about metallic strain gauges like that. 
you can see how they look like so it's a, a rectangle the typical dimension that really varies on what you need but it's from few millimeters to few centimeters length uh, we'll see what's this is in a minute you can see here we have the terminals that we use to connect uh, the strain gauge uh, to a bridge circuit by the way the, the bridge circuit is uh, very very similar to the ones that you have just seen for the temperature sensors uh, you can get a strain gauge like that a single strain gauge that measures in uh, the horizontal direction like this uh, or if you need to measure in multiple directions uh, you can get something that's called a strain gauge rosette and uh, this has uh, more strain gauges in uh, several directions so for example you can see okay here I have one strain gauge measure that measures in this direction and I have another strain gauge that measures in that direction or you can get uh, a strain gauge rosette where you have three strain gauges like this so the angle is uh, 120 degrees and then of course you need basically three circuits uh, to evaluate uh, the changes in uh, in the strain uh, we'll see the circuit uh, a little bit later so this really depends on your application what do you need to measure if you need to measure uh, the strain only in a single axis then you will get uh, a single strain gauge like that you will install it on, on your object if you need to measure uh, the strain in multiple directions then uh, you get the strain gauge rosette and uh, you install and measure in several directions let's take a look on how the strain gauge is made now it can be either a wire strain gauge or a foil strain gauge in both cases it is a thin shape like this either of a wire or a foil that is placed on some backing material now the backing material can be paper it can be polyamide for example depends on what, what you need for your application so when you buy a strain gauge it looks like this it's, it comes on the tape like that and uh, you then use special glues uh, to glue that to your object this is the strain gauge itself the, the part in black here is uh, the, the trace so here, here we have the terminals where we solder the wires to the strain gauge and uh, here we can see that those tracks that's uh, the strain gauge itself the material of a strain gauge needs to be something that is uh, not that much dependent on temperature so typically it's made from a constantan foil a constantan is uh, an alloy of uh, copper and nickel and uh, one of properties of constantan that are important in this application is that it has a very small temperature coefficient of resistance in other words, it's uh, almost not changing its electrical resistance with temperature. And that's what we want here, because we want to measure temperature, uh, so, sorry, we want to measure force or strain, and we do not want to measure temperature. So we cannot make it from platinum, because then it would be a temperature sensor and not a strain gauge. So how we can describe the dependence of uh, what we want from the strain gauge on strain mm. let's take a look first on this uh, picture here I have the strain gauge I do not apply any force to it so force is zero and initially uh, the grid of my strain gauge has some length it's basically nothing else than the wire and for a wire we can calculate its electrical resistance it looks like this resistance equals to resistivity rho times length divided by the cross section of my wire so now if I apply tension to my strain gauge like that 
I will change the length by some value of delta L and this means that uh, I have a larger L in my wire and I will have a larger resistance. What will happen is that if I stretch the wire I will also decrease its uh, cross-section so like that. So I'm applying tension I'm increasing length and I'm decreasing the cross-section. So this will even more increase the electrical resistance. Of course the, the length changes here in my picture are exaggerated. In reality they are very small. We cannot uh, see them. We, can, we just have to measure them with some very precise instruments. On the other hand, if I apply compression I will decrease the length, so uh, I have smaller L, which will give me smaller resistance, and I will increase the cross section, and I will even further decrease the electrical resistance. So, in a strain gauge, we are looking for the changes of electrical resistance. However, we do not need to know what is the absolute value of uh, the resistance we simply don't care about that but what we are looking for is the dependence between the change of electrical resistance compared to the initial value as a function of strain and we know that strain is defined as the change of length over the original length so if we apply uh, this knowledge uh, we may derive the, the formula that uh, describes the dependence and we'll find out that it's uh, a fairly simple equation. We'll find out that the change of electrical resistance as a function of strain, that's the delta L times uh, over L here, is a linear dependence. So we'll use some constant K that uh, is called the gauge factor and uh, basically what this means is that the electrical resistance is changing in a linear way on strain. However, this is valid with a good level of accuracy only for metallic strain gauges. If you go a little bit deeper into what K is made from you'll find this out. Now in this formula we have uh, two parts of our, of our equation. This one with the mu is uh, based on the geometry that we have there. Mu is uh, the Poisson number. And uh, this part is uh, very large compared to this part for metallic strain gauges. So metallic strain gauges in uh, most, uh, let's say the, the, the largest part uh, is uh, coming from the pure geometry. The second part you can see delta rho over rho as a function of, uh, of strain. And this part is coming from uh, what's called a piezo-resistive effect. And the piezo-resistive effect is especially important in semiconductors. So if you have a semiconductor strain gauge, then this will be the dominant part. And this will still be there, but uh, will have a much smaller magnitude. So for metallic strain gauges, we don't care that much about this, because this is very small. And we work with the pure geometry. For semiconductor strain gauges now this is the largest part and this is much smaller so if we are talking only about metallic strain gauges we're talking about that and uh, uh, for metallic strain gauges the gauge factor is uh, approximately 2 so it's a linear dependence for metallic strain gauges for semiconductor strain gauges, both parts will be there, and for semiconductor strain gauges, uh, we'll see that uh, they have a nonlinear dependence on strain.
plus they will have a very large dependence on temperature as well. Now if you look on this equation, it's a linear equation, so K is nothing else than sensitivity, the slope of, uh, of my curve. If I would plot the uh, strain on the x-axis and uh, resistance changes on the y-axis, now this would be the slope of my of my curve. So we, we may call it gauge vector, uh, we may call that sensitivity. Uh, let's take a look on how we can use the strain gauges. Uh, we may of course mount the strain gauge directly on uh, our object. If we are building something like weight, then we need to weight some object and uh, we need to have some intermediate object that will uh, change its shape. And uh, this object is called a load cell. I will show you three types of load cells. The, the use of them depends on uh, what uh, force range do you, do you require to, me to measure. Let's start with the S-type load cell. It's having a form like this, the letter S. Uh, and the strain gauges are hidden here in the middle of the load cell. Now, uh, in strain gauges, you use almost exclusively a full bridge. So it means that you are using four sensors, four strain gauges. The reason is temperature compensation. And again, detail, uh, details about this were given in uh, the basic class of sensors. So we he here we have full bridge connection, four strain gauges in, in the middle of this the cavity. And if we apply force on my load cell like this, uh, we will measure the deformation of, uh, of that part and uh, this will give us some idea about the weight. So now, some idea means that we need to calibrate that, we need to calculate that. But uh, basically we measure the output voltage of our bridge and uh, this is proportional to the applied force. Now, this cavity uh, needs to be hermetically sealed because uh, we need to protect the strain gauges uh, from moisture, from, uh, from dirt and uh, typically this cavity uh, is either sealed with some sealant material or uh, it can be welded so that uh, it's hermetically closed and uh, the only thing that we have here is a, is a connector that uh, connects the, the cable. The second type of load cell is uh, called the beam load cell. It's uh, having a form of a beam. So uh, here is the cavity with the strain gauges. Uh, the strain gauges are inside of this cavity, so we can we cannot see them. Uh, it's uh, welded typically, and uh, we apply the force on this side of the beam. And now this will be downward force or upward force. And uh, this part is uh, attached to some platform, for example, to some holder uh, of our weight. I have some pictures a little bit later that uh, sh will show you how this is installed. And again, here is a connector that uh, allows you to connect it to the bridge. Uh, there are some interesting videos. I recommend you to take a look on, on them. You can see how th it's, it's made, what's inside, and uh, also some example applications. The third type of uh, the load cell is uh, a compression load cell. So this works on compression. We apply a downward force like this and uh, inside there is basically a column like that and uh, we have strain gauges on the sides. Again a full bridge connection and uh, this measures compression. So this is for compression, this was measuring bending, and this was giving us compression as well, but compression in terms that I have changed the shape of my, of my load cell. So typically the S-type load cell and uh, the beam load cell are used uh, for smaller forces, 
a bit smaller it, it may mean few hundred uh, few hundred newtons or a few kilonewtons as well and uh, the compression load cell is uh, used uh, for much larger forces if you for example want to measure to, to weight a train or a truck then this uh, compression load cell might be a good uh, good way to go for example here this one uh, on the picture on the left uh, that it has a range of uh, 10,000 kilograms so this is a like, fairly large range on the other hand this might be something like 10 kilograms so the beam load cell and S type load cell is typically used for smaller forces this is used for larger forces now let me show you some examples mm -hmm of uh, where we can actually find strain gauges so it's a very common type of sensor for mechanical engineering uh, here you have an example of uh, strain gauge measurements on uh, railroad tracks so it may for example weigh the train or count the cars uh, or it may diagnose uh, the behavior of, of the track if temperature is changing for example in all applications it's uh, quite important to work with the temperature compensation so uh, unless you compensate very carefully the temperature changes the strain gauge itself will act as a temperature sensor and not as a force sensor so temperature compensation here is quite important here you can see a few more examples from mechanical engineering you can analyze the stresses on a, on a pins like that uh, on a crankshaft that you can see here uh, anywhere you need to analyze uh, and verify for example a finite element model then, then you can use a strain gauge to calibrate your model a uh, few more examples um, here you can see a frame of a bike and here in the detail you can see the strain gauges installed like that so several strain gauges installed several places on the bike everywhere so that they can verify uh, the design and that they can for example calibrate the, the model and uh, verify if uh, the frame is good enough or if they need to make some, some changes um, some more examples um, from mechanical engineering here you can see a bearing and uh, strain gauges like that installed at several places again to verify the mechanical properties you can see the same here on those two pictures strain gauges on many interesting places and again it can be used to verify the stiffness it can be used to verify the calculation model for example uh, Strain gauges are not limited only to parts that are stationary. You can use them also um, on rotating parts. So like that you have a strain gauge that's mounted on a shaft. Here you can see some strain gauges over there uh, on a turbine blade. And uh, then you just uh, connect that to a, to a bridge which might be looking like this. Battery powered for example. And uh, you get the data with uh, some wireless transmission it's not limited only to metallic materials here you see an example of uh, strain gauges installed uh, on uh, a laminate material carbon fiber laminate uh, you can see that uh, they have several strain gauges here so two here two there and two here and two here uh, so those two are used to measure the strain and you can see that uh, those four in here they are on some backing material so those two will be used for temperature compensation so they will not measure the strain but uh, we assume that they have the same temperature like those ones and uh, therefore it will be a full bridge electrically but uh, in terms of measurements it will be a half bridge where those two strain gauges measure and those two strain gauges are used for temperature compensation now in this picture they have uh, this is one area so this is one full bridge 
and here this is second full bridge you can see in the picture that it's uh, independent it's not interconnected uh, let's see where we can use the screen gauges uh, it's typically used uh, in waiting applications so uh, here you can see the beam load cell in a kitchen weight so this is where it's connected to the platform to the, to the bottom of, uh, of your weight and uh, on this part this is uh, where the top platform will be connected so here you put some flour or some sugar uh, that you need to wait in a kitchen and uh, it will bend the beam the strain gauges are in here unfortunately they're not visible here but they will be somewhere here on the bottom around this cavity and uh, here this cabling then goes to a unit that is basically a bridge connection and that you get the voltage proportional to the bending uh, a similar weight is shown over there uh, we can see the two strain gauges here there's, there's one strain gauge and here there's another strain gauge uh, we apply weight on this uh, screw this will change the shape of this uh, of this piece this load cell and uh, the change of strain is measured with the strain gauge again this is going to the unit here this will have uh, some display and uh, it's basically nothing else than a precision voltmeter okay so uh, that's all for uh, the strain gauges that's all for our lecture for the first lecture uh, we'll see us next time in a week and we'll see us also on the lab class.